God bless us and the Virgin protect us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In regards to the sins of a whole nation, there was an absolutely unprecedented example this past October. During the very month in which we commemorated the 100th anniversary of the miracle of the Son, one nation, in an official and publicized act, committed one of the most monstrous blasphemies imaginable against Our Lady. On October 31st, commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, the Vatican issued a postage stamp, which, as the Vatican explained, quote, depicts in the foreground Jesus crucified, and in the background a golden and timeless view of the city of Wittenberg, with a penitential disposition, kneeling respectively on the left and right of the cross. Martin Luther holds the Bible, source and destination of his doctrine, while Philip Melanchthon, theologian and friend of Martin Luther, one of the main protagonists of the Reform, holds in hand the Augsburg Confession, the first official public presentation of the principles of Protestantism written by him. Close quote. So we find at the foot of the cross, kneeling in the place of Our Lady, Father Martin Luther, holding his version of the Bible, out of which he personally tore out seven Old Testament books and even changed the wording in Romans 3.28 to suit his fancy as if God couldn't get it right in the first place. And in the place of St. John the Beloved, we find Philip Melanchthon, author of the Augsburg Confession, which is the first official public explanation of the Lutheran heresy. We'll take a closer look at Father Luther in a moment. But first, let's quickly consider one of the so-called reforms that these two men advocated. Father Luther and Melanchthon both stated that Henry VIII could practice polygamy. Henry didn't take their advice openly, but he did so privately. Henry married Anne Boleyn in January 1533 and got divorced from Queen Catherine of Aragon four months later in May of 1533. It gets better. In December of 1539, a German count named Philip of Hesse asked Father Luther if he could please take a second wife while retaining the first. In a written opinion, Father Luther Melanchthon stated that the second marriage was not contrary to the law of God, and that Philip might enter into it, but they demanded that this new marriage, as well as this written document, should remain secret in order to avoid scandal. The document was delivered to Philip, who had six other Protestant ministers sign it. On March 4, 1540, in the chapel of the castle of Rotenburg, in the presence of witnesses, including Melanchthon, this so-called marriage was solemnized. Truly, Father Luther and Philip Melanchthon are the poster children, and I mean the perfect poster children, for the official explanation of Morris Letizia. Now let's take a closer look at the man for whom the Vatican has removed the matrix of all graces, the man for whom the Vatican has removed the call redemptrix, the man for whom the Vatican has removed Our Lady of Sorrows, a closer look at the man whom the Vatican has honored by placing him at the foot of the cross in place of Our Lady. That man is Father Martin Luther. We'll just consider a tiny selection of the teachings of this Judas priest, this diabolical monster. Father Martin Luther explained his authority, quote, I am certain that I have my teaching from heaven. Whoever teaches differently from what I have taught herein or condemns me for it, he condemns God and must be a child of hell. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. Therefore, my judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Consider how Father Luther began his absolutely extraordinary work against private mass and the ordination of priests. 
Now keep in mind, I'm quoting Father Luther himself. Quote, I will begin with myself and make a little confession to you. I once awoke at midnight when the devil began to dispute with me in my heart after the following manner, as he is able to make many a night of mine bitter and miserable enough. The sweat broke forth and my heart began to tremble and to beat. The devil knows well how to put his argument, and he has a deep, powerful voice. Close quote, Father Luther. So Father Luther tells us he spent a night disputing with the devil, and that this is common for him. And that's extraordinary enough. But then Luther follows this with 11 pages summarizing this discussion with the devil, during which the devil attacks private masses and priestly ordinations. And that's even more extraordinary. But here's the crowning touch. Quote, Luther's book against private mass may be divided into two parts. In the first, Luther gives the devil's reasons against private mass. The second, he gives his own reasons against private mass. This extraordinary arrangement of a work containing about 100 pages shows how fully Luther agrees with the devil's teaching concerning mass. It is therefore not unfair to say that this lengthy book may be thus divided. Part one, the reasons of the devil against private mass. Part two, the reasons of the disciple of the devil against private mass. Close quote. In other words, the book should be entitled Against Private Mass and the Ordination of Priests by the Devil and Father Martin Luther. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. We continue. Father Martin Luther explaining moral theology, quote, What harm could it do if a man told a good lusty lie in a worthy cause for the sake of the Christian churches? And, quote, if we allow the commandments any influence in our conscience, they become the cloak of all evil heresies and blasphemies. And, quote, do not ask anything of your conscience. And if it speaks, do not listen to it. If it insists, stifle it. Amuse yourself. And then, if necessary, commit some good big sin in order to drive it away. Conscience is the voice of Satan. It is necessary always to do just the contrary of what Satan wishes. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's, not mine. Father Martin Luther explaining the role and dignity of women. Quote, the word and work of God is quite clear, namely that women are made to be either wives or prostitutes. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Father Martin Luther explaining marital chastity. Quote, if the husband is unwilling, there is another who is. If the wife is unwilling, let the maid come. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Father Martin Luther explained the exclusivity of marriage. Quote, it is not in opposition to the Holy Scriptures for a man to have several wives. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Father Martin Luther on relations with the Jews. Quote, now what are we Christians to do with this rejected, damned people of Jews? I will give my honest advice. First, their synagogues or schools are to be set on fire. Whatever will not burn is to be covered and heaped over with earth, so that never again shall one find stone or cinder of them left. And this is to be done in order to honor the Lord and Christianity, so that God may see that we are Christians. Secondly, their houses are likewise to be broken down and destroyed. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. Father Martin Luther on the moral beauty and perfection of the Lord. I will not quote this, but merely summarize it from a Lutheran work, of which I have a copy. Now this is from a Lutheran work published in 1913 in Weimar, Germany, and in which... In a mixture of German and Latin, Father Luther accuses our Lord of having committed adultery three times. And he names the women. Absolutely satanic blasphemy. Whoever does not accept my teaching cannot be saved. My judgment is at the same time God's and not mine. It's easy to understand the comment of that great doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila. 
quote, I had another most fearful vision of hell, which filled me with the very great distress which I feel, the sight of so many lost souls, especially the Lutherans, for they were once members of the church by baptism. So when all this is considered, it's clear that Luther himself is a type of the destroyer. And yet, this is the precise man who the Vatican is on by placing him at the foot of the cross in place of Our Lady. During the centennial of her great miracle of the Son, we get a diabolical mockery of Our Lady, shoved right in Our Lady's face, shoved right in Our Lord's face. Remember that in the first secret, Our Lady said, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to an immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. Many souls will be saved from going to hell if, as God wishes, devotion to the immaculate heart is established. If, as God wishes, devotion to the Mac of the Heart is established, many souls will be saved from going to hell. And instead, we get blasphemous treatment of her immaculate heart. We get, as it were, an act of satanic defiance, a work of art capturing itself all the offenses for which we make reparation on first Saturday. Father of the Protestant Bull, Luther, the priest whose rebellion spawned all these offenses against her immaculate heart. And we get this propagated, this blasphemous treatment by the Vatican State itself in an official capacity. In an official capacity. Remember the words of Sister Lucy de Father Fuentes in her last interview. Quote, Let us remember that Jesus Christ is a very good son. And he does not permit that we offend and despise the Most Holy Mother. We've recorded through many centuries of church history the obvious testimony which demonstrates by the terrible chastisement which have befallen those who attack the honor of his most holy mother, our Lord Jesus Christ, has always defended the honor of his mother. Close quote. Jesus Christ is a very good son. He does not permit does Most Holy Mother be offended and despised? Terrible chastisements we follow as we attack the honor of His Most Holy Mother. Our Lord Jesus Christ always defends the honor of His Mother. Don't think that the Vatican State is going to be spared the smearing of sacrificial blood. Don't think it for a minute. I take this to be the occasion of the blowing of the sixth trumpet. We continue. As we've seen, because of the gravity of this sin, the status of the sinner together determine the magnitude of the defilement. Defilement is far, far worse when priests, or worse yet, the high priest sinned. And of course, the priest and high priest of the Old Testament foreshadow the priest bishops and pope of the new covenant. Now, before we go any farther here, let's pause and remind ourselves of two fundamental truths. First, that there is one objective and two subjective aspects to any sin. The matter of a sin, what the act is in itself, is objective. Well, the two subjective aspects of any sin are the knowledge, that's a sufficient reflection, and the act of the will, the consent given. A formal sin includes all three of these, huh? In other words, the act was wrong, the person knew darn good and well it was wrong, and yet he consented anyway. Since we don't have access to the interior life of someone else, 
We don't know whether any particular act he committed was done with sufficient reflection and full consent of the will, which is precisely why we should give someone every benefit of the doubt in regards to concluding that he's guilty of formal sin. But this does not mean that we can't judge acts in themselves, as long as we don't conclude from the act the interior disposition of the person committing it. There are acts that, are, objectively speaking, are in and of themselves sinful. For example, blasphemy, fornication, sodomy, contraception. And whether or not the person committing an act has actually committed a sin formally, whether the person is guilty of formal sin, in other words, whether he actually knew what he was doing was wrong, had thought about it and consented nonetheless, even though we ourselves may have absolutely no idea whether the person was doing it knew it was wrong, had sufficient reflection of full consent of the will, even without knowing any of those things, we can still say that objectively speaking, that is sinful. Objectively speaking, blasphemy is always and everywhere a sin. Objectively speaking, fornication is always and everywhere a sin. Objectively speaking, contraception is always and everywhere a sin. Okay? So that's the first fundamental truth to keep in mind. We can make judgments about the objective sinfulness of various actions without concluding to the interior dispositions of those who commit those acts. The second principle is no one can judge the Pope. Quote, it is a fundamental principle based upon divine law that the Roman pontiff cannot be judged by any human person, ecclesiastical or civil. Close quote, the Canon Law Society of Great Britain and Ireland. This means that in the case of a pope who does or says things that are clearly immoral, in each and every instance, no matter how bad a particular statement or act may appear, we must always limit ourselves to judgments about the objective qualities of the act or statement. This is essential. So the two fundamental truths to keep in mind are first, we can make judgments about the objective sinfulness of various actions without concluding the interior dispositions of those who commit those acts. And second, since no one can judge the Pope, we must always limit ourselves to judgment about the objective qualities of his acts or statements. All that being said, as we've seen, when speaking of the defilement by sin of the land and the altar, the gravity of the sin and the status of the sinner together determine the magnitude of the defilement, which meant that the defilement was far, far worse than the priest, or worse yet, the high priest sinned. We've seen the priests and high priests in the Old Testament foreshadow the priests, bishops, and pope of the New Covenant. While considering the trumpet plagues, we've also seen that if men don't repent, the one trumpet plague will flow into the next and propel it along in a manner of speaking. And according to the interpretation we're following, the demonic locusts of the last trumpet plague are the bishops, priests, and religious who actually embraced the spirit of Vatican II and its associated spirits. And so they haven't simply polluted the land with their sins and thereby polluted the sanctuary. They've actually been wreaking havoc in the sanctuaries of the world themselves. They've actually been wreaking havoc with the holy things, with their liturgical abuses, with their abusive treatment of our Lord and the most blessed sacrament of the altar, with their twisting of scripture, dogma, and morality, and destruction in general, and all this on a worldwide scale. And add to that that the reality that we currently have a high priest, a pope, who is a type of the destroyer. I'll just limit myself to one observation. The official interpretation of Morris Letizia is that through some strange moral calculation, a confessor is supposed to give his approval to people who are living in sin and committing adultery to go to communion. So how many people are going to go to hell in that if they don't repent? The priest, for sure, and both those people. And that's the official interpretation and the acts of the Holy See. So, the result of these locusts and the Pope that's a type of the destroyer is the defiling the whole earth by the global ravages and forces the crowd to heaven for vengeance pales and significance to the utter horror, the desolation, the defilement brought on earth by the sins of the clergy. So
So once again, given that those sins have polluted both the land and the altar, given that the altar that needs purifying in this case is actually the earth, given that the only way the altar can be purified is by smearing blood on the four horns, given that the four horns symbolize the four corners of the earth, all parts of the earth, given all that, then sacrificial blood must be smeared over all parts of the earth. We continue. And I heard a voice from the whole four horns of the great altar, which was before the eyes of God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Loose the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who were loosed were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to kill a third part of men. As we heard in the commentaries, the four captive angels are demons whose task is to lead a demonic army to punish the people of the world by killing a third of the population. But these four angels may also represent four nations. This assault is a divine judgment upon a corrupt civilization. We saw that with the prophets of old, the region of Euphrates was ever the country once came the enemies of God's people, and that this may literally represent peoples from the region of the Euphrates who are hostile to the church. The release of these four evil spirits may indicate a resurgence of Islam, may lead Muslims to unite with communists in a holy war against all nations who will not join them or submit to their domination. We saw the four evil spirits have waited a long time for the hour in which they might begin their depredations. They cannot begin their murderous work until the very day and hour. Their bloody task is to kill a third of the human race. The second world culminates in the reign of Antichrist, a period in history described by the ancient fathers as the most dreadful of all. So given all that, we'll follow a two-fold interpretation in this conference. On the one hand, there truly are four demons that have been bound in the Euphrates that will be loosed by the sixth angel in response to the voice crying out from the altar. The angels will be released, and all four corners of the earth will feel their vengeance. These angels were prepared, waiting for this exact moment in history to be released at an hour, month, day, and year fixed by God. Our Lord will allow them to be released because it's time for justice. So that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, these four angels actually represent four nations, not necessarily in the political sense of nation states, although they might be, but certainly of peoples from the region of the Euphrates who are hostile to the church who give themselves over to the diabolical influence of these four demons. And as instruments of the four demons, these nations will be involved in some way in the murderous slaughter. Precisely which nations these are will become obvious over time. There are certainly plenty of candidates in that part of the world. The Euphrates starts in Turkey, it passes through Syria and Iraq, and then after it meets the Tigris River, the confluence, which is then called the Shad al Arab on the west bank, or Arban Rud on the east bank, forms part of the boundary between Iraq and Iran until it flows into the Persian Gulf. So you do have four nations along there, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Currently two of those nations, Syria and Iran, are aligned with Russia. And the number of the army of horsemen was 20,000, times 10,000. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and they that sat on them had breastplates of fire, of hyacinth, and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and from their mouths proceeded fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three plagues was slain the third part of men, by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For the power of the horses in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like to serpents and have heads, and with them they hurt. From the commentaries, quote, The first woe about torment, the second brings death. The chastisement sent upon the world increased with the growth of iniquity and the approach of Antichrist. Unlike the locusts, these beasts with lion heads and serpent tails are given permission to kill masses of humans, both physically and spiritually. They cause the physical death of idolaters, compromising and persecutors of the church, who are all already spiritually dead. The death stroke against their bodies makes certain their spiritual death for all eternity. It will be a time of wars developing into a world revolution that will deluge the whole world with carnage and bloodshed. The three and a half years of the reign of the beast will be its climax. This is a divine judgment on a corrupt civilization, those who are elsewhere in the apocalypse called the dwellers on the earth. Significantly, this cavalry is exactly double the size of 10,000 times 10,000, the number who attend the Lamb as they encircle the throne in Apocalypse 5.11. The number of God is three and man's number is six. The army of man is twice the size of God's loyal following. 200 million is a symbolic and an approximate number. St. John makes it especially emphatic by adding, I heard the number of them. 
Number indicates a universal revolution and overthrow of governments with incessant guerrilla fighting when every person carries weapons for self-defense and pillage, plunder, and murder become universal. And innumerable armies advancing from the Euphrates, the origin of Israel's traditional enemies, as a fierce, hostile, demonic force sent by God in answer to his people's prayers for vengeance. In short, this army is the fulfillment of all the warnings in the law and the prophets of avenging hordes sent to punish the covenant breakers. By these four angels and the 200 millions of horsemen, many understand the devils and their instruments, men incited by them in Antichrist's time, to make war and persecute the Church of Christ, who shall destroy a third part, that is, a greater part of men than in the world. The cavalry recall Habakkuk's description of the Chaldeans, who were not led by reason nor by laws, but rather by their lust to dominate, and who placed a great burden on the peoples they subjected by tyrannically issuing decrees, demanding that what they commanded be immediately done and were to invade Judah with horses swifter than leopards and fiercer than wolves. The horses have the head of lions, which are emblems of royalty, and great powers of propaganda, alluding to the beast, who has a mouth of a lion. These monsters will preach the overthrow of government so that they have a chance to subjugate and tyrannize the peoples. They are related to the beast in their power of propaganda and in being rulers of the world. The horses and riders execute the judgment of God. The horses would then represent the institutions or organizations that are filled with satanic hatred against God and Christ. The rise direct the institutions and forces, and through them rule and direct world events. The colors of the breastplates of the cavalry soldiers, the fiery red in color, a dusky blue color, is a sulfurous smoke, and a sulfur-like yellow, are correlated with the fire, smoke, and sulfur that proceed from the mouths of their mouths, and they seem to forebode the approach of the empire of Antichrist. The colors reveal the character of the riders. Fire is a symbol of hatred, the smoke, blasphemy, and sulfur, rebellion against God and his law. The principal background of these verses is the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, since the precise combination of fire, smoke, and sulfur occurs only there. The power of the horses is in their mouths, propagating their will and tyrannizing over peoples by promulgating laws against God's ordinances, by emitting hatred and blasphemies against him, by inciting rebellion against all authorities established. Their mouths would pour forth blasphemous propaganda against God, calculated to scare men away from belief in him, and to rob them of all revealed religion. The result would be hatred of God and of their fellow man, rebellion against God's law, refusal to keep his commandments, and a surrender to voluptuousness and immorality. The fire, smoke, and sulfur are three separate plagues. The fire is persecution and war. Smoke symbolizes the obscuring of doctrine and the weakening of faith. Sulfur, the moral depravity which follows. The fire, smoke, and sulfur issue from the mouth of the horses, which signifies not only death, but also deception. This deception is an essential aspect of the torment, and it manifests itself partly through false teachers affirming the legitimacy of some form of idolatry for Christians. From the mouth should proceed words of wisdom. Instead, there come forth heresies and incitements to revolt and revolution. They kill with their mouths, while with their tails they only injure their victims. The tail is a symbol of error, deceit, hypocrisy, and false doctrines. The venom of these tail serpents does not kill, and is therefore of a spiritual nature. They instill doubts, agnosticism, unbelief, rebellion against authority, and possibly atheism, as a serpent in paradise advised unbelief and rebellion against God. The heads of the serpent tails can devise means and ways of deceiving and misleading people who give ear to the new doctrines of death. These warriors breathe fire and smoke and brimstone implies that the destruction they bring is connected with the final destruction of the beast and the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet are cast in the lake of death, where their torment is associated with fire and brimstone and smoke. This lake of fire is also mentioned as a destination of all the wicked at the end of the world. Close quotes. Thus the commentaries. Okay. As is obvious from the commentaries, there are layers of meaning here, and we're certainly not going to hit on all of them. As we've seen, because it's time for justice, the four demons from the Euphrates have been released, and all four corners of the earth will feel their vengeance. And as we've seen, those four angels also actually represent four nations, people from the region of the Euphrates who are hostile to the church, who give themselves over to the diabolical influence of these four demons. And as instruments of the four demons, these nations will be involved in some way in the murderous slaughter. Now in this passage, we are seeing how this vengeance will be poured out upon the earth in the form of an army, 200 million strong, a number which is both symbolic and approximate. It's exactly double the size of the number who attend to the Lamb, as in circle the throne. In other words, this demonic army is twice the size of God's love falling. In approximate terms, it indicates the millions of armed men in a worldwide war with incessant guerrilla fighting, 
which a third of the men on earth are slaughtered. We've seen that this passage describing demonic cavalry sweeping over the earth on these monstrous horses harkens back to Habakkuk's description, description of the Chaldeans, driven by their lust to dominate, who swept over the land and horses swifter than leopards and fiercer than wolves, who placed a great burden on the peoples they subjected by tyrannically issuing decrees demanding what they commanded be immediately done. The horses are said to represent the institutions or organizations are filled with satanic hatred against God and Christ. The riders are said to direct the institutions of horses and through them rule and direct world events. These riders wear breastplates of three colors, fire red, dusky blue color as of sulfurous smoke, and sulfur-like yellow. Fire red symbolizes hatred, the blue smoke symbolizes blasphemy, and sulfur yellow symbolizes rebellion against God and his law. The fire, smoke, and sulfur that pour out of the mouths of the horses are three separate plagues. The fire is persecution and war. Smoke symbolizes the obscuring of doctrine and the waking of faith. Sulfur, moral depravity, which follows. The fact that these are pouring out of the mouths of the horses signifies deception. From the mouth should proceed truth and wisdom. Instead, heresies, corruption, incitements to revolt and revolution pour out. The tales are like unto serpents, symbolizing treachery, lying, false doctrines, and hypocrisy. They kill with their mouths. Or with their tails, they only injure their victims. So given all that, for the purposes of this conference, although we're not obviously not saying that these monstrous horses are engaged in killing a third of mankind yet, we are going to take these monstrous horses as symbolizing the institutions or organizations that are filled with satanic hatred against God and Christ, as representing such things as the mainstream media, the educational establishments, the drug traffickers, and other organized criminal enterprises, the entertainment industry, the organ transplant industry, terrorist organizations, the music industry, social media, the financial industry, the advertising industry, the contraceptive industry, the arms industry, the corrupt political regimes, unbridled capitalism, communism, Islam, Zionism, and so forth. And in that regard, while speaking of the apocalypse, Pope Benedict XVI made some enlightening remarks. Quote, We think of the great powers of the present day, of the anonymous financial interests which turn men into slaves, which are no longer human things, but are an anonymous power which men serve, by which men are tormented and even slaughtered. They, the anonymous financial interests, are destructive power, a power that menaces the world. In the power of the terrorist ideologies, violence is done apparently in God's name, but is not God. They are false divinities, divinities that must be unmasked, that are not God. And then drug trafficking, this power that, like a devouring beast, extends its hands over all parts of the earth and destroys. It is a divinity, but a false divinity, which must fall. Or also the way of life propagated by public opinion. Today it's done this way. Marriage doesn't matter anymore. Chastity is no longer virtue, and so forth. These ideologies that dominate so much that they impose themselves with force our divinities. Close quote, Benedict XVI. And he said that the book of Revelation sheds light on this struggle against these false gods. In terms of the mouths and the tails of these monsters, we'll take the tails as symbolizing spiritual deception by which their victims are harmed spiritually beings by means of lying, hypocrisy, treachery, but their mouths are being symbolic of the principal means by which these institutions and organizations kill men, both spiritually and physically. We'll take the fire that pours from their mouths as symbolizing the persecutions and wars spawned by corrupt political regimes, drug trafficking, terrorist organizations, economic predation, hatred of the church, etc., etc. We'll take the smoke that pours from their mouths as symbolizing the obscuring of doctrine and waking of the faith promoted by these organizations and institutions, for example, the mass media attacks on Christ, his mother, his doctrine, the Holy Scriptures, the sacraments, the church, virtually every aspect of Christian morality. We'll take the sulfur that pours their mouths as symbolizing the moral depravity promoted by these organizations and institutions. For example, the music and film industry's constant promotion of blasphemy, unbridled sensuality, drunkenness, drug use, sexual immorality, homosexuality, etc., etc., in other words, the principal means by which these organizations and the institutions kill people, both physically and spiritually, can be summed up as a deliberate and even scientific promotion 
of the seven deadly sins. Let's take a moment to run down the list. Lust. For example, fornication, porn, or perversions. Heavily promoted by the porn industry, the music industry, the entertainment industry, the educational establishment, the advertising industry, the publishing industry, the mainstream media, the social media, among others. Envy. For example, keeping up with the Jones, or resenting some supposed privilege of another social class or race. Heavily promoted by the educational establishment, the social media, corrupt political regimes, the advertising industry, among others. Anger. For example, war, violence, and murder. Heavily promoted by the corrupt political regimes, terrorist organizations, the abortion industry, the video game industry, the entertainment industry, the mainstream media, the music industry, among others. Covetousness. For example, disordered desires for wealth, power, social status, fame, the latest gadget or style. Heavily promoted by the advertising industry, the entertainment industry, the publishing industry, mainstream media, among others. Sloth, for example, the welfare state, heavily promoted as a means of social control by corrupt political regimes, among others. Gluttony, for example, drunkenness and drug use, heavily promoted by the drug traffickers, the advertising industry, the entertainment industry, the mainstream media, among others. Pride, for example, atheism, Feminism, supposed superiorities, racial or otherwise, and since we're here, American exceptionalism. Heavily promoted by corrupt political regimes, the educational industry, the mass media, the entertainment industry, among others. In fact, many elements in the traditional movement where there are so many people who know every rule but have not charity. Now, when all this is considered, it's easy to see that the society has truly been prepared for utter disaster. When we're talking about virtues and vices, generally speaking, people will get what they want. So if they want to be virtuous, let's say, and they want to grow in patience, they'll get plenty of opportunities to grow in that virtue. That's obvious enough. If they want to be vicious, if they want to commit one or more of the seven deadly sins, they'll get plenty of opportunities to grow in that vice as well. People get what they ask for. So when you have a whole world drenched, and there's a rush, a whole world covered with people who really, really want to commit the seven deadly sins, then you're going to have hell on earth. And we're just about there. We're just about there. And when everything finally breaks loose, it's going to be unreal. And because this scene of a demonic cavalry sweeping over the earth on these monstrous horses harkens back to Habakkuk's description of the Chaldeans who swept so rapidly over the land, we'll also take them to be symbolic of a very swift war sweeping over the globe. And we'll take those Chaldean cavalrymen who were driven by their lust to dominate and place a great burden on the peoples they subjected by tyrannically issuing decrees and demanding what they commanded to be immediately done as foreshadowing the riders on those monstrous mounts. And we'll take the riders who are driven by their lust to dominate to be symbolic of the men who actually rule, who actually direct world events by means of these various institutions, organizations. We'll take these rulers, these riders, to be symbolic of the rulers, the elites who actually run and control things such as unbridled capitalism. Communism, Islam, Zionism, the mainstream media, the music industry, the drug traffickers, and other organized criminal activities, the arms industry, terrorist organizations, the social media, the financial industry, the advertising industry, the contraceptive industry, various political regimes, etc., etc. And we'll take the breastplates of the writers as being symbolic of the means by which they protect and consolidate their power. As we've seen, the fiery red color symbolizes hatred. So we'll take the fiery red breastplate as symbolizing the bloodshed by which these elites hold and maintain their power. The blue smoke color symbolizes blasphemy. And since fiddling enough, blue is also the supreme color 
of masonry. We'll take the blue smoke breastplate as symbolizing the lodges and secret societies which these elites employ in maintaining their power. The sulfur yellow color symbolizes rebellion against God and his law. So we'll take the sulfur yellow breastplate as symbolizing the immoral use of power by which these elites employ and maintain their position. In terms of the 200 million soldiers, we heard in the commentaries that that number indicates a worldwide revolution and overthrow of governments with incessant guerrilla fighting when everyone is armed and pillage, plunder, and murder become universal. Given that, we'll take that number to signify in approximate terms the men engaged in just such an upcoming world war, to include not simply the respective militaries of the various nations fighting, but also a horde of jihadists who come from the region of the Euphrates and who, besides rising up there, are also currently occupying forward positions scattered around the world, awaiting a signal to rise up. It would also include, as the commentary mentioned, an innumerable number of armed citizens, some of whom would be defending themselves and their loved ones, and given the state of society, many of whom would be taking advantage of the social chaos to prey on others. Sister Lucia seems to be referring to this in her comments on the third secret, quote, the third part of the secret refers to Our Lady's words. If not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be marred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. The third part of the secret is a symbolic revelation referring to this part of the message, conditioned by whether we accept or not what the message itself asks of us. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, etc. Since we did not heed this appeal to the message, we see that it has been fulfilled. Russia has invaded the world with her errors. And if we had not yet seen the complete fulfillment of the final part of this prophecy, now that's an important phrase. Again, the final part of the prophecy reads, if not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecution of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. We continue with Sister Lucia. If we have not yet seen the complete fulfillment of the final part of this prophecy, we are going towards it little by little with great strides. If we do not reject the path of sin, hatred, revenge, injustice, violations of the rights of the human person, immorality and violence, etc., and let us not say that it is God who is punishing us in this way. On the contrary, it is men themselves who are preparing their own punishment. In this kindness, God warns us and calls us to the right path. We're respecting the freedom he has given us. Hence, men are responsible. Close quote, Sister Lucia. If we have not yet seen the complete fulfillment of the final part of this prophecy, various nations being annihilated, we're going towards it little by little with great strides. But it is men themselves who are preparing their own punishment. If we do not reject the path of sin, hatred, revenge, injustice, violations of the rights of the human person, immorality and violence, etc. And so when you have a whole globe covered with people who really want to commit the seven deadly sins, you're going to have hell on earth. Look at the kind of behavior we see on Black Friday. That's just people fighting over toys and merchandise. Where do things really break down? Like in a war. And you have food shortages, social unrest, power outages, and so forth. It will be hell on earth. Murder, rape, pillage, and burn like nothing we've ever seen. The blood of a third of the world's population poured out over the earth, smeared on the four horns of the altar. As the commentary stated, this is a divine judgment on a corrupt civilization. Those who are elsewhere in the apocalypse called the dwellers on the earth the idolaters, compromisers, and persecutors of the church who are already spiritually dead. The death stroke against their bodies makes certain their spiritual death for all eternity.
There will be a time of wars developing into a world revolution that will deluge the whole world with carnage and bloodshed. The three and a half years of the reign of the beast will be its climax. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. I mean, you don't need me to tell you on the very brink of such a horrendous war. The war drums are beating and everything is in place. Everything. All that's missing is a spark. We continue. And the rest of the men who were not slain by these plagues did not do penance from the works of their hands. They should not adore devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither did they do penance from their murders, nor from their sorceries, nor from their fornication, nor from their thefts. So in spite of the fact that a full third of mankind perishes in this terrible conflagration, the sinners still did not repent from their devil worship, idolatry, murder, sorcery, and the word sorcery could actually translate it as their involvement with the cult and drugs. They didn't repent from their fornication or their stealing. It's like the Egyptians after the plagues. The surviving sinners remain obstinate in their evil. We're now going to shift gears. So far we've been reading the scripture and citing commentaries and on that basis offering interpretation of those passages in light of Fatima. The reason for going through this Bible study in this fashion was to demonstrate we're actually using the analogy of faith in our interpretation. In other words, to show that we weren't just making this up out of whole cloth. But as we said earlier, because of the limits of time, we weren't going to look at every passage. And the problem is the lack of information, simply trying to condense what we do have into the time that we've got. What we'll do now then is offer a brief summary of the next two chapters, chapters 10 and 11 of the Apocalypse, and then we'll spend more time in chapters 12 and 13 before we close. So chapter 10. A mighty angel comes down from heaven. He's got a rainbow over his head. One foot on the sea, one on the land, with a little scroll in his hand, his right arm raised up to swear an oath. The rainbow is a reminder of that covenant with God that men have forgotten and rejected. Mind that God hung in the sky to keep us in mind, to remind us of why he destroyed the world with water. The angel thought to be one of the archangels has come to remind us of the covenant. But because of their total lack of repentance, there will come upon man a chastisement never before foreseen on earth before the seventh trumpet blows and time comes to an end. The angel came to tell us there will be no more delay. The time is running out and judgment is upon us. He lifts his hand to, he- to heaven as a way of saying before God, as God is my witness, I am telling the truth. Time shall be no longer. Our Lady is no longer able to hold back the judgment. The time for judgment against the obstinate sinners has arrived, which means a great persecution of the Antichrist. After this, the seventh trumpet will sound, the mystery of God will be finished, and he will come in judgment. St. John is told by a voice from heaven to take the little scroll and eat it. The scroll brings sweetness to the mouth and bitterness to the belly. The words will be sweet to the mouth because our Lord will bless all those who preach his word in truth and charity. Sweet because of the upcoming triumph of the church but bitter to the belly, because he who preaches the truth will endure great persecutions and hardships for preaching the truth. Bitter to the belly because of the horrifying persecutions awaiting mankind. Bitter to the belly for the apostasy and final damnation of so many weak souls. And St. John is told to prophesy again. Thus chapter 10. Chapter 11. St. John is commanded to measure the temple and number the people found therein. Here again, the temple is a figure of the church, and those who worship there, the faithful, remain steadfast during the great persecution of the Antichrist. St. John is given a measuring rod, command, quote, Arise and measure the temple of God and altar, and then the door therein. But the court, which is without the temple, cast out, and measure it not, because it's given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread underfoot two and forty months, close quote. So St. John is told to measure the inner court. That symbolizes the true church, but he's commanded not to measure the outer court. In Scripture, measuring signifies the division between the holy and the profane. Symbolically, then, the outer court has no faith and is separated from the true church and is given over to the Gentiles, the followers of the Antichrist. In other words, the faithful Catholics will join up and be united with the followers of the Antichrist. 
And although these are most definitely men without any faith, they will nonetheless appear to be within the temple, that is to say, within the church. In other words, the outer court here, with this congregation of non-believers, is in fact a false church, with no faith, which is separated from the truth, and which will deceive and persecute the true believers, a persecution we're told will last 42 months. Now, in regard to this false church, we'll consider excerpts from a very penetrating conference in last May in Rome by Father Linus Cloving. Now, Father Cloving refers to the false church as an anti-church because he's reflecting on some remarks made in this regard by St. John Paul II when he's a cardinal. But we just don't have time to get into all this really interesting. We're only going to look at what Father Clovis says. Quote, It is self-evident that the Catholic Church and the anti-church currently coexist the same sacramental, liturgical, and juridical space. It is self-evident that the Catholic Church and the anti-church currently coexist in the same sacramental, liturgical, and juridical space. The anti-church, having grown stronger, is now attempting to pass itself off as the true church, all the better to induct or coerce the faithful into becoming adherents, promoters, and defenders of a secular ideology. Should the anti-church succeed in commandeering all the space of the true church, the rights of man will supplant the rights of God through the desecration of the sacraments, the sacrilege of the sanctuary, and the abuse of apostolic power. Thus, politicians who vote for abortion and same-sex marriage will be welcome at the communion rounds. Husbands and wives who abandon their spouse and children and enter into adulterous relationships will be admitted to the sacraments. Priests and theologians who publicly reject Catholic doctrines and morals will be at liberty to exercise ministry and to spread dissent, while faithful Catholics will be marginalized, maligned, and discredited at every turn. Thus, the anti-church should succeed in achieving its goal of dethroning God as creator, savior, and sanctifier, and replacing him with man, the self-creator, the self-savior, and the self-sanctifier. To achieve its objectives, the anti-church, in collaboration with the secular powers, uses the law and media to browbeat the true church into submission. By adroit use of the media, the activists, the activists of the anti-church have managed to intimidate bishops, clergy, and most of the Catholic press into silence. Equally, the lay faithful are terrorized by fear of the hostility, ridicule, and hate that will be visited upon them should they object to the imposition of LGBT ideology. Close quotes. It is self-evident that the Catholic Church and the false church currently coexist in the same sacramental liturgical and juridical space. Blessed John Henry Newman cites a commentary written on this chapter some 200 years ago. Quote, The Church of God on earth will be greatly reduced in its apparent numbers in the times of Antichrist by the open desertion of the powers of the world. This desertion will begin in a professed indifference to any particular form of Christianity and the pretense of universal toleration which toleration will proceed from no true spirit of charity and forbearance, but from a design to undermine Christianity by multiplying and encouraging different sects. The pretended toleration will go far beyond a just toleration, even as it regards the different sects of Christians. For governments will pretend an indifference to all and will give a protection and preference to none. From the tolerance of the most pestilent heresies, they will proceed to the toleration of Mohammedanism, atheism, at last, to a positive persecution of the truth of Christianity. In these times, the temple of God will be reduced almost to the holy place, that is, to the small number of real Christians who worship the Father in spirit and in truth and regulate their doctrine and their worship and their whole conduct strictly by the word of God. The merely nominal Christians will all desert the profession of the truth when the powers of the world desert it, which is typified by the order to St. John to measure the temple and altar and leave the outer court to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles. The property of the clergy will be pillaged, the public worship insulted and vilified by these deserters of the faith they once professed, who were not called apostates because they never were in earnest in their profession. Their profession was nothing more than a compliance with fashion and public authority. In principle, they were always what they now appear to be, Gentiles. When this gentle desertion of faith takes place, then will commence the sackcloth ministry of the witnesses. Close quote. We continue with the themes in the chapter. During this horrific 42-month-long persecution, Enoch and Elijah returned to preach against the Antichrist. Enoch is the great-grandfather of Noah, 
was taken up, Elijah is the prophet. The father's teeth are now living together, hidden somewhere on earth. They'll come back to the reign of Antichrist. Suarez, the Jesuit theologian, states that, quote, it is of the faith that neither Enoch or Elijah have died, close quote. Both Suarez, as well as that great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, teach that it is heresy, or proximate to heresy, to deny that the two witnesses in chapter 11 of the Apocalypse are Enoch and Elijah. Enoch has a special mission to the Gentiles and Elijah to the Jews. They will both preach and perform miracles, convincing many to reject the Antichrist, and in the case of the fallen away Gentiles, to turn once more to the Holy Catholic faith, and largely the preaching of Elijah, the Jews will finally embrace Christ as the Lord and God. Enoch and Elijah will be killed in Jerusalem and lay in the streets for three days while the forces of evil party. Then to the horror of the enemies of God, they will be resurrected and assumed into heaven. And this ends the second world. The seventh angel, shortly after this, blows his trumpet and it's judgment day. After giving this overview of the work of Enoch and Elijah, St. John records another vision, which gives many other details not seen thus far. So here we are, he's looking at different areas. So we're going to move back in time, we're turning back a little bit. Because we've just gone to Judgment Day, but now we're going to go back and look at more details in, in the sequence of things that we've already talked about over these conferences. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried tra- travailing birth and was in pain to be delivered. For the purpose of this conference, we'll give a twofold signification to the woman here. In the first place, and as we've looked at in an earlier conference, following the lead of Popes Paul VI and St. John Paul II, we'll take this as Our Lady, and specifically Our Lady of Fatima, appearing during the first trumpet play, the slaughter of World War I, in response to the plea of Pope Benedict XV. In the second place, the woman clothed the sun is also symbolic of the Catholic Church, clothed in the faith and grace of Christ. The moon is symbolic of the ever-changing things of this world under feet, and it's under feet which symbolize her authority over them. The holy doctors, St. Gregory the Great and St. Augustine, both, quote, see in this the dominion of the church over the whole world and her contempt for the perishable goods of this life, close quote. Now, as we all know, it's the constant, uninterrupted uh, tradition that when our Lord passed out of Our Lady like light through a window pane, Our Lady's delivery was totally painless. So although it's true she didn't suffer bringing forth our Lord, she suffered unspeakable pains and giving spiritual birth the rest of us, especially at the foot of the cross, when she cooperated with her son in bringing forth the church. And furthermore, the church is said to be ever in labor to bring forth her children to eternal life. We continue. And there was seen another sign in heaven. Behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail drew the third part of the starts of heaven and cast them to the earth. We'll also give a twofold interpretation to these lines. Firstly, in an earlier conference, we saw that during his visit to Fatima, St. John Paul II referred to Our Lady Fatima as a woman clothed by the sun, the same image used by Paul VI, and that he summarized the message of Fatima as being a call to conversion, a warning to have nothing to do with this great red dragon, citing these very lines. Another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast into the earth. And we briefly considered several scriptural commentaries regarding those two lines. We saw, among other things, that the red signified anger, blood, especially martyrs' blood, and communism. We saw that in this passage, heaven is a symbol of the church. And the fact that the great red dragon is there indicates that he will be present within the church, most especially in the persons of apostate bishops and priests, who we can now see are actually the locusts of the fifth trumpet plague and are symbolized by the stars dragged down by his tail which is itself a symbol of the lying and the cunning hypocrisy with which he succeeds in deceiving a large number of people and pastors with the love of earthly things, by lying, hypocritical, worldly-minded clergy, by false teachings and changes in doctrine, which we can now see resulting from the errors of Russia flowing to the church through the third uh, trumpet plague, which is Tyhar, the fourth trumpet plague, which is the New Theologians, and the fifth trumpet plague, the Locus, which gives the context to Sister Lucia's remark in Portugal, the dog and the faith will always be preserved. We haven't yet addressed this phrase about the dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. So, secondly, the dragon is also, quote, a symbol of Satan his political aspect and activity. As the church is the mystical body of Christ, so the evil world powers constitute the body of Satan, of which he is the soul. As a dragon, Satan, through the evil world powers of that time, will enter the church, 
perhaps by stealthy suggestions having long before, before directed the choosing of candidates for the Episcopate, will now endeavor to hinder the election of the worthiest candidate for the papacy. The dragon weighs a diadem on each of the seven heads. The seven heads suggest the seven deadly sins from which all other sins and vices flow, and through which Satan thwarts the saving of souls. The ten horns intimate the principal institutions in the world inimical to the kingdom of Christ. Close quotes. So we've already considered the question of a pope that is not the most worthy candidate. We saw that we currently have one that is a type of the destroyer. And we've just considered the seven deadly sins in the global phenomenon. We saw that the whole world drenched in the errors of Russia, the whole world covered with people who really want to commit the seven deadly sins. We're going to have hell on earth. We're virtually there. We continue. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be delivered, he might devour her son. And she brought forth a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her son was taken up to God and to his throne. Here again we see a twofold significance, but the first pertains more properly to the interpretation we're following. In the first place, quote, the man-child is a faithful and holy people which the church brings forth for Christ. Therefore, the sense is that the church, and especially at the end of the world, since that is what is most properly being spoken of here, shall bring forth sons, faithful and holy, with masculine, strong, and unconquerable hearts, shall perish by martyrdom under the Antichrist, and these holy, strong, elect sons of God shall be snatched up to heaven by their deaths. Close quotes. Of course, those are the ones we see climbing the mountain in the vision of the third seat. In the second place, it's Our Lady. Quote, the woman who brings forth the son to rule the nations with a rod of iron. These are the identical words of a prophecy found in Psalm 2, verse 9, concerning our Savior, Jesus Christ. And quote, as St. Ambrose says, there's one son whom the Blessed Virgin brought forth, and whom the church brings for, because Christ, with all his members, name of the faithful, is one body and one person, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And the woman fled in the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, that there they should feed her a thousand two hundred sixty days. Quote, the church must seek sanctuary and solitude there to be guided by God himself during those trying days. We continue. And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael his angels fought with the dragon, the dragon fought and his angels. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent was called the devil and Satan, who seduced the whole world, and he was cast into the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Quote, the battle is waged in the church. The kingdom of heaven, from which the devil and his angels are cast out and hurled down to earth. The earth symbolizes the nations hostile to the church, the world over which Satan rules. By the aid of St. Michael, the church shall purge herself of all heretics, schismatics, and apostates. Close quote. So we take this to signify the time at which, by the direct help and aid of St. Michael and his heavenly host, there's a definite split between the false church and the true church. And we really need to pray to St. Michael for that. We really need to pray for Cardinal Burke. We really need to pray. We continue. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Because the accuser of our brethren is cast forth who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell therein. Quote, St. Michael and his angels give glory to God for the victory of the church, which is achieved by the power of the precious blood shed for man's redemption. Victory was also made possible by the invincible courage of the faithful who hesitated not to give their life in defense of the church. Thus shall be days of great persecution in which the church will suffer all the horrors of the early ages, but she will likewise be crowned with the glory of innumerable martyrs. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the male child. And there were given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the desert unto her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half time from the face of the serpent. Quote, Woe to the earth and the sea, that's all mankind. Realizing that time of his power is short, Satan will now loose upon earth all his rage and fury in a last effort against the church. His attempt to destroy from within, having failed, 
since now, by the action of St. Michael's heavenly host, there's a split between the false church and the true church. His attempt to destroy her from within having failed, he will now seek to crush her by hatred and persecution from without. In this new danger, the church shall receive the rings of an eagle to defend her and carry her to the place of refuge which God has prepared. Close quote. So the devil knows this is final battle. And he's been unleashed, so he'll be more ferocious than ever before. So woe to the earth and the sea. The two wings of the eagle symbolize the word of God, Old and New Testament, and also the two witnesses. These will lift up and help sustain the church during the Sabbath persecution during this final battle. This battle is the battle of battles because it's the culmination of all the battles throughout history from the very first battle in the heavens right up to the final battle in the apocalypse. And the serpent cast out of his mouth after the woman water as it were a river that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. Quote, a flood of water often signifies bitter tribulation and persecution as we see in Psalm 68, verses 2 and 3. Save me, O God, for the waters have come in even to my, unto my soul. I stick fast in the mire of the deep, and there's no sure standing. I am coming to the depth of the sea, and the tempest has overwhelmed me. This water is a river, as it were a river, being cast out of the serpent's mouth, signifies a multitude of violent persecutors. For example, an army of the Antichrist, who search for, pursue, capture, or kill the faithful who have taken refuge in the mountains and the wilderness. Close quotes. We continue. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the river, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Quote, Just as we read in Numbers 16, that the earth opened up and swallowed Kor, Dathan, and Abiram, so also God and the angels guarding the woman, that is to say the church, caused the earth to open again its mouth, as it were, and swallow the persecutors sent by the Antichrist. And the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed, who kept keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He went to make war with the rest of her seed, quote, namely those who did not flee nor hide themselves in the wilderness, or those who, because they were in regions so distant from the Antichrist capital, they sought themselves out of range of his rage. We continue. He stood on the sand of the sea. St. John is now looking at a different aspect of his intellectual vision, so in terms of time, we're now going back to again shortly before the sixth trumpet. Quote, Satan will seek to lead the faithful astray by a false messiah whom he will raise up in the person of the Antichrist. This new adversary is to spring from the sea, which stands for all those nations and peoples hostile to the church. So Satan takes his stand by the shore to call forth the man of sin, the son of perdition. It is a solemn moment of fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten diadems, and upon his heads names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard, and his feet were as it were uh, the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So the beast from the sea is the Antichrist. In his book on the Antichrist, that great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellman, states there are two most certain facts. He is principally coming for the Jews, who will be received by them as the Messiah. Secondly, he will be born of Jewish stock and circumcised and observe the Sabbath, at least for a time. As the Lord said to the Jews, You have rejected me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will not reject. St. Robert also points out a fearful symmetry. Just as Christ first came to the Jews, to whom he was promised, by whom he was expected, and then later joined the Gentiles to himself, so also the Antichrist will first go to the Jews, by whom he, whom he was expected, and later, one after another, he will subject all the Gentiles to himself. St. Robert points out the Antichrist is not the devil incarnate. Only God can take on another nature. The devil has an angelic nature, so he can't become incarnate, but only possess a man. St. Robert, quote, he will, he will be the most perfect instrument of the devil, so that in him is the bodily expression of all possible diabolical malice, just as in Christ our Lord was the bodily expression of all divine goodness. Quote, As a representative of Satan, the Antichrist will be aided and abetted by the same kings and rulers, symbolized in both instances by the horns and diadems. He will fall in the footsteps of his master by employing every form of sin and error to seduce the faithful. The heads are branded with the names of blasphemy. Hence, they symbolize the sins and errors that will afflict the church. Seven, the number of universality indicates that in this final struggle to prevent the universal reign of Christ, all forms of sin and error will be marshaled against the church. The number seven is also appropriate, since all sins are included in the seven deadly sins. And the dragon gave him his own strength and great power. Quote, the dragon gave the Antichrist first his authority and majesty, 
Secondly, permission in every means to persecute the faithful. Thirdly, the skill, powers, and power of deceiving. Fourthly, the power to do fake miracles through sorcery, through the revealing of hidden things, and through the semblance of raising the dead, etc. Close quote. All the fathers teach that the Antichrist will be the most incredible sorcerer who ever lived, learned in witchcraft, spells, and the black arts. He will be possessed by the devil from his very conception, or at least by his infancy, and will perform all mar- his marvels by satanic power. He will appear to raise the dead and heal the sick, but these will be demonic illusions. But why will the Antichrist perform all these marvels? St. Robert Bellman notes that just as Christ our Lord did true miracles to demonstrate his divinity, so the Antichrist will perform all these fake satanic wonders so he can prove he's God, so he can convince everyone, virtually everyone, that he's the Christ, so he can convince virtually everyone that he's God. He will deny that Jesus is the Christ and institute Jewish laws. He will proclaim himself to be Christ and God and will demand to be worshipped as such. He will attack all other gods, even the true God. And I saw one of his heads as it were slain to death, and his death's wound was healed. And all the earth was in admiration after the beast. And they adored the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they adored the beast, saying, Who is like to the beast? And who shall be able to fight with him? Quote, According to the venerable Bede and others, the Antichrist will fake a lethal and curable wound, and then simulate his death as if it resulted from this. Then after three days have passed, he will unexpectedly present himself as having come back to life. And by this means he may imitate Christ rising from the dead on the third day. Close quote. So the beast rises up from the sea, in other words, from the society wracked by war, destruction, chaos, the seven deadly sins. And then in a diabolical attempt to steal God's glory and make it his own, he presents himself as the savior of the people. He presents himself as one sent to save them from this chaos and darkness. And then he imitates the death and resurrection of our Lord in a way that will have every appearance of being miraculous. And many will believe and follow him, giving him the glory he came to steal from God. And they'll actually be adoring him as if he were the Lord, who is like to the beast. And by adoring him, they're actually adoring the devil, who gave him the power to perform these wonders. And it was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to do two and forty months. Quote, all Orthodox Catholics teach this means he will rule for three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Seven years ago, Bishop Sheen commented on the blasphemies of the Antichrist. And I quote Bishop Sheen. Our Lord tells us that the Antichrist will be so much like himself that he would deceive even the elect. How will he win followers to his religion? He will become disguised as great humanitarian. He will talk peace, prosperity, and plenty, not as means to lead us to God, but as ends in himself. He will write books on the new idea of God to suit the way people live. He will induce faith in astrology so as to make not the will, but the stars responsible for our sins. He will explain guilt away psychologically as an inhibited sexuality. He will make men shrink in shame if their fellow men say they're not broad-minded and liberal. He will identify tolerance with indifference to right and wrong. He will foster more divorces under the disguise that another partner is vital. He will increase love for love and decrease love for persons. He will invoke religion to destroy religion. He will even speak of Christ and say that he was the greatest man that ever lived. His mission, he will say, will be to liberate men from the servitudes of superstition. In the midst of all his seeming love for humanity and his glib talk of freedom and equality, he will have one great secret which he will tell no one. He will not believe in God. And because his religion will be brotherhood without the fatherhood of God, he will deceive even the elect. He will set up a counter-church, which will be the ape of the church, because the devil is the ape of God. He will have all the notes and characteristics of the church, but in reverse and emptied of its divine content. And with the mystical body of the Antichrist, that will in all externals resemble the church as the mystical body of Christ. In desperate need for God, he will induce modern man in his loneliness and frustration to hunger more and more for membership in his community that will give men enlargement of purpose without any need of personal amendment, without the admission of personal guilt. Close quote. The Antichrist also blasphemes the tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven in this verse. Quote, The hatred malice of Satan inspiring Antichrist will reserve its most venomous shafts for the Church and especially for the Holy Eucharist. 
The sacred mystery of the real presence of Christ has thwarted all the malice of Satan who inspired the Antichrist to exert all his efforts against that dwelling and the real presence there. The tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven stand for the whole church and all the church holds sacred, the sacraments, the priest, and religious life, the Christian family, the infallible dogmas, and the moral law. The whole efforts of the Antichrist during the 42 months of his reign will be directed against all that God has planted in the human heart and instituted in this world because Satan knows it will be his last chance to wreck the work of Christ. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Quote, to subjugate, capture, and kill them. Quote, this Antichrist will wage this war against all who will not apostatize from the church, accept his doctrines, submit to his dominion. We've already spoken of this war several times. It will be the most savage persecution in the history of the world. Nothing else even comes close to it. And power is given over him over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. In other words, he'll rule the world. And all that dwell upon the earth adore him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, which was slain from the beginning of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. The statement, if any man have a ear, let him hear, harkens back, for example, to Apocalypse 2.7, where we read, quote, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's a warning to hear and listen to the truth and to stand up for the truth, because the way a man lives determines what happens to him. So the statement is a call to each individual man to hear and respond to the truth, not to rely on or blame others, the shepherds. Not to rely on or blame others. Or to rely on the shepherds to guide him during this time of chaos. He has to take responsible for the truth. He has to take personal responsibility to hear the truth. But the men who don't care about the truth will end up actually adoring the Antichrist. The men who are seduced by his lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. They didn't want to hear the truth. As a just punishment for the rejection of the known truth, as a just punishment for the willful and stubborn blindness and error, God will permit the, the men who don't love the truth to have what they do want and what they do love, which is the lie. And so they will follow the Antichrist and adore him. All that dwell in the land, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. And at that point in history, that means almost everyone in the world. He that shall lead in captivity shall go into captivity. He that shall kill by the sword must be killed by the sword. Here's the patience and faith of the saints. Quote, they who have led the faithful in captivity and put them to death shall themselves be made captive and put to the sword. Hence the faithful must suffer in patience with full confidence of victory. And I saw another beast coming out of the earth up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he executed all the power of the former beast in his sight, and he caused the earth and them that dwell therein to adore the first beast, whose wound to death was healed. The second beast, the false prophet, comes up from the land. Quote, St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, and others take this beast to be a notorious deceiver, who shall be the precursor and herald of Antichrist. After the fashion of Christ, let St. John the Baptist as a precursor, and the false prophet will preach and promote the Antichrist with great sign. And quote, the beast rising from the earth is the false prophet, the prophet of Antichrist. He has his representative in the false prophet who will be endowed with the planet of satanic powers to deceive the nations. We continue coming up out of the earth. Quote, the earth whence comes the second beast is a symbol the Gentile nations revolt against the church. What does it mean to say the beast comes up out of the earth? If we look at the Greek work that St. John used here, we see the sense is that it refers to the land. So it might be better translated, the beast that comes from, up from the land, who caused the land, those dwelling in it, to worship the first beast. So what's the point here? When the Greek Old Testament refers to someone who comes from the land, someone who dwells in the land, obviously it refers to the people who live in the Holy Land. They dwell in the land. But it's an expression that actually means something other than that. It has a very specific meaning. We have the same sort of thing in English when we say kick the bucket. Obviously, when you say kick the bucket, it could mean actually doing just that. But in general, when it means something other than that, it means to die. So when the phrase dwell in the land is used in the Old Testament, there's a sense of foreboding here. 
since it means the people of Old Covenant had apostatized and become pagans, were about to be destroyed and driven out of the land. Or it refers to heathens like the Canaanites, who originally were living there, and it means they're about to be destroyed and driven off. So that's the Old Testament sense of the phrase. And as we know, the people of Old Covenant foreshadow the people of the New and Everlasting Covenant, which we belong to, as we're reminded of in every Holy Mass, the consecration of the most precious blood. So with that as background, it's pretty easy to understand the sense of this phrase. When we hear about the priest coming up from the land, a false prophet, who causes the land and those in it to worship the first beast, it tells us the people of the New Covenant, Catholics, have apostatized and become pagans, that they and their pagan neighbors are about to be destroyed, at least spiritually speaking, and that the false prophet, who is himself apostatized from the Catholic Church, is by means of his preaching and his marvels going to seduce the apostate Catholics and their pagan neighbors into following his leader, who is the Antichrist. And he had two horns like a lamb. The Lord specifically warns we should, quote, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Quote, it's important to remember that false prophecy is not a pagan cultural phenomenon, but is instead a heresy that appears only within the covenant context. It is an imitation of true prophecy and operates to deceive God's covenant people and to work in opposition to his true prophets. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus warned that false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Quote, these two horns give the appearance and simulation of a meek holiness, that he would appear to be a lamb, and can form great signs, that he would appear to be a miracle worker. He can unite men to draw multitudes over to the sect and yoke of the Antichrist. It seems, therefore, this false prophet shall be some apostate bishop, a hypocrite and traitor to ecclesiastical honors, who with his preaching will fill the people with the poison of the dragon. Quote, the two horns denote a twofold authority, spiritual and temporal, as indicated by the resemblance to Lamb, the prophet will probably set himself up in Rome as a sort of anti-pope. Close quote. That is an imprimatur from most hundred years ago. And he spoke as a dragon. How does a dragon speak? He uses deceptive, subtle, and seductive speech to draw people, God's people away from their faith and into a trap. Furthermore, he's a liar, a slander, and a blasphemer. Quote, his doctrine shall be cunning, deceitful, poisonous, and diabolical, and therefore most apt for deceiving men. For just as the dragon, that is the devil, deceived Eve, speaking through the mouth of the serpent, so will he speak through the mouth of this false prophet. And he executed all the power of the former beast in his sight, and he caused the earth and them that dwell therein to adore the first beast, whose wound was to death. Quote, from a common commentary with an imprimatur almost a hundred years ago. The Antichrist will establish himself in Jerusalem, a great number of Jews will have gathered together some, through some such movement as Zionism. When the Antichrist manifests himself to those in Jerusalem with his lying wonders, they will immediately proclaim as their king and messiah. Then through the power of false miracle, the false prophet will soon leave the Gentile nations to adore him as a true messiah promised of old by the prophets. And he did great signs that he made also fire to come down from heaven unto the earth in the sight of men. And he seduced them that dwell on the earth, for the signs which were given him to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make the image of the beast which had the wound by the sword and lived. And it was given to him to give life to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should speak, and should cause that whoever will not adore the image of the beast should be slain. Quote, The false prophet shall have the power to perform the wonderful works of his master. Among other prodigies, he will bring down fire from heaven, probably to offset the preaching miracles of Elijah and Enoch, and thus seduce great numbers. He will also have statues of the Antichrist directed to be adored by those whom he has seduced. These statues will give out oracles, as did those of ancient paganism. In fact, the reign of the Antichrist and his prophet will be a veritable renewal of paganism throughout the world. And he shall make all, both great and little, rich and poor, free men and bodmen, to have a character on the right hand or in their foreheads. And no man might buy or sell, but he that hath the character or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Quote, Several parallels seen in the Apocalypse indicate that the beast from the sea, his demonic rival, mimics the lamb. One, the lamb is worshipped by angels and saints, while well, the beast is worshipped by the wicked. Two, the lamb was slain and rose again, while well, the beast was supposedly mortally wounded and recovered. Three, the lamb sits on the throne of his father, while well, the beast shares the throne with the dragon. Four, the lamb redeems believers from every tribe and nation, while well, the beast has a temporal authority over every tribe and nation. Five, the lamb is worthy of power and glory from God, while the beast receives power and authority from the dragon. And six, the name of the lamb is stamped on the foreheads of the saints, while the number of the beast is branded on the brows of sinners. That's 
as we just saw. Quote, again from a commentary uh, with an imprimatur almost 100 years ago. The followers of Antichrist will be marked with a character, an imitation of the sign of a baptism and confirmation. This indicates that the Antichrist's prophet will introduce ceremonies to imitate the sacraments of the church. In fact, there will be a complete organization, a church of Satan set up in opposition to the church of Christ. Satan will assume the part of God the Father, Antichrist will be honored as Savior, and his false prophet will usurp the role of Pope. Their ceremonies will counterfeit the sacraments, and the works of magic be heralded as miracles. Close quote. So the false prophet, who is propped up by the power and authority of the first beast, asks as a chief liturgist, theologian, and preacher for the first beast, who is, of course, the Antichrist. Now, taking into consideration the false church spoken of by Bishop Sheen and the commentators, and that this is uh, going to be an apostate bishop for the purpose of this conference, we'll take this person to be the same person as the destroyer, who, as we heard, aims at the destruction of the church, the destruction of the faith of his poor victims, the destruction of their souls forever in hell. His minions are leaders of heresy, schism, and persecution. He's actually opened himself up to the spirit variously named a bad Napoleon or exterminans, destruction destroyer exterminator, and he's a bishop or a priest that will follow the Antichrist and do his bidding. So we'll take this person to be the same person as the destroyer. We continue. Here's wisdom. He that hath understanding, let him count the number of the beast, for as the number of a man, the number of him is 666. And on wisdom and understanding, all those who allow themselves to be caught up in politics and the spirit of Vatican II and all the scandals and errors and chaos are going to wind up hardening their heart. And as a result of getting caught up in all these diabolical soap operas, they lose the ability to maintain a simple, peaceful, interior disposition so they keep growing faith, hope, and charity. Just consider how humble and simple Our Lady was. She didn't get caught up in all the scandals created by the Pharisees or the ones created by the Sadducees and the high priests. She didn't get caught up in all the scandalous lives of the Caesar and other civil war rulers. And then after Palm Sunday, that diabolical spirit swept over the nation. All those people that had hailed our Lord on Sunday, under the influence of that spirit, turned from Christ to Barabbas and Caesar. Except for Our Lady and those who stayed close to her, those who preserved their humility and tranquility, they weren't swept away in that chaos. So by avoiding as much as possible all the scandal and chaos, and by staying very, very close to Our Lady, we'll be able to maintain that simple, peaceful interior disposition, keep growing in faith, hope, and charity. And just as the blood of the Paschal Lamb sprinkled on their doorposts have protected the people of God from the destroyer of old, so also the precious blood of our Lord, the Lamb of God, will protect those who truly invoke it. it will give them the ability to maintain that simple, peaceful interior disposition and to keep growing in faith, hope, and charity. And those who do, do these things will have the wisdom and understanding to recognize the beast and his false prophet. They'll have his number, so to speak, and they won't be deceived as long as they remain simple, as long as they remain close to Our Lady, invoke the most precious blood to wash over them, to cleanse them, to protect them from the wickedness and snares of the devil. The necessary wisdom and understanding will be given to those remain simple and humble, who stay close to Our Lady and evoke the precious blood, just as wisdom and understanding far, far beyond the years was given to those simple children in Fatima and their saints. They're all saints in heaven. And that's what really matters. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.